Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Medical Myths, the show about what not to do with your body. And today, my special guest is Deborah. Um, she is newer to the community, has her own channel. And in a second, I'll let her talk about that. Um, but we're back. It's been a while since we've been here. Uh, I know I've taken a month off, but we're hopefully back to a more regular schedule now. And uh, Deborah, how are you today? I'm doing well, Ben. How are you? Doing great. I mean, we've been hanging out a lot this week. Um, would you like to tell the audience where they can find you? I would. Um, I have. Uh, I stream every Monday night. It's called Let's Be Let's Get Real About Mental Health. It's on at seven o'clock Pacific time. Um, and it is, um, where a place where you can talk, place where you can talk about, um, what's going on with your mental health and what, uh, we give helpful hints to deal with different crises. We talk about different experiences so that we can help each other. And that's the whole point of it is I want people to know they're not alone and that they can reach out and we'll, we'll address the issue for. Them. Awesome. And there's a particular reason why. Uh, we brought you on today for uh, Medical Myths, especially for talking about uh, emergencies. So what is that reason? <laughs> what is I your background? A, Tell us a little bit about yourself. I am a retired paramedic. Um, I have been in healthcare in one facet or another my entire adult life. Uh, I started out as a CNA, became a paramedic, then ran memory cares and uh, um assisted living, stuff like that. But I, the majority of it is I spent 20, 20 plus years uh, as a paramedic, mostly on the streets of Las Vegas. So I've seen some pretty gnarly emergency stuff and I'm very, uh, very adept in the stabilization and transporting of, of people, so. All right, the audience is saying that you're really quiet for some reason. Hmm. Um, and I adjusted on my end, and I can hear you just fine. Let's see where we're at here. Oh, it's better. Beck says it's better now. Okay. Oh, okay. I adjusted the volume, so hopefully it's okay. it's good. Um, so we're talking. Oh, it's a little better. I can adjust it even more. So we're talking today about first aid myths. And if anybody has a myth that you've heard about, uh, in first aid, like there was one from Scarlett earlier on talking about something that I'll bring up in a second, but some things we might not uh, have as part of the article we're reading. So if you have another myth that you want to talk about, uh, tag me in the side chat and we can try to address that as well. Um, before we get into the article that we were originally going to talk about, uh, I want to pull up the myth that, that Scarlett had mentioned before the stream, <laughs> which uh, I didn't know. I didn't know that this was a thing. Oh, yeah. But supposedly people were going around saying that if you see someone or if you personally are suffering from a stroke, that you use acupuncture and you take a needle and poke your ear a few times uh, to restore blood flow and... <sighs> This is not true. Don't do this. It will do nothing except make your ear hurt. That's that's all that it will do. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I I I looked in to see if maybe this was like something on chakras or something like that, but there isn't a, an acupressure point in your ear that's supposed to lower your blood pressure, but not in an emergency situation it's a it's not going to do it fast enough and b i mean you're really just going to prolong your time away from the hospital by thinking that you're going to stop this stroke it's i mean it's impossible to unless you intervene with some heavy duty medicines to stop a stroke so you know yeah yeah a stroke is from decreased blood flow to the brain and there's no mechanism by which poking your ear will improve blood flow to the brain that's ridiculous so yeah it's wasting time and it's preventing people from getting the help that they need so don't don't do this yeah especially in this day and age when we have um all those um 
acronyms in place and they're being broadcast on public television, you know, it really does stress the fact that the most important thing, the best thing you can do for yourself is call 911 when you think you're having a stroke because time mm. is brain is brain tissue. The longer you that area goes without it, the the worse the deficits are going to be. Yep, call the ambulance first. And then worst case scenario, if like in that case, if the ambulance gets there and they're okay, uh, then you had an emergency ambulance show up for no reason, which I mean is not great, but it's better than someone going without help. So we would rather Absolutely. somebody get help that they don't need than to, you know, go without help. Uh, yeah, aspirin isn't really helpful for stroke. Uh, it, we don't really use it. It's more of a symptomatic thing in, in terms of, uh, heart attacks, but it's, yeah. yeah, that's a whole, whole separate discussion we could get on right there. Uh, yeah, but let's, let's yeah, yeah, let's pull up the article that we had looked into before coming onto the stream. So this is from a website called wellness mama. It's a blog and she has all of these articles about health and wellness and she they're pretty terrible. She gives a lot of medical advice that she is not qualified to give. And this article is my natural first aid kit and remedy cabinet. So right off the bat, we have um, a lot of essential oils. We've got some herbs. We've got some some plants, lots of stuff going on here. Yeah, um, you don't need in, a, in an emergency. Yeah, so what before we start reading the article, what are your thoughts just going like if you were a person and you just found this article on the internet, what is your first thought? You know, I actually thought when I first read it, that was one of the uh, concerns I had is that she's putting it out there, even though she says she's not a doctor, the way it's put out there, it's like, oh, these things are 100% going to work. How do I do this? How do I, I wanted more information? And my natural incline would be to go to her and say, Hey, well, what about this? Cause it sounds like she's done all these things. So I think she's really misleading the uh, general population mm -hmm. with how effective or um, how important it is to not do what she says. So it's uh, yeah, it's very misleading in my opinion. Yeah. Um, she let's read the the whole first paragraph because she gets into the disclaimer. So she starts off saying, despite our best attempts to live a healthy and toxin free life, there are times when illness or injury strike. In some of these cases, like trauma, conventional medical treatment is clearly warranted. OK, so she's right off the bat. She at least said one thing that's OK. Yeah. And I'm certainly grateful that medical treatment is available if needed. But what about the times when illness or injury is not life-threatening, but merely uncomfortable or limiting? The following is a list of what you'll find in my medicine cabinet and first aid kit. It is a combination of remedies I've tested myself, ones suggested by a naturopathic doctor, and ones that I hope to never need. Please note that I am not a doctor and don't play one on the internet, so this list is for informational purposes only and is not intended to be used as a replacement for medical attention. So she gives the disclaimer and then... That's after she's already said, yeah, you should use this stuff. And then she goes on later to talk about uh, medical advice. And she gives medical advice in her comment section. People go to her comments mm -hmm. and ask her for help with their issues. So she says she's not giving advice, but she clearly is. And she phrases all of this as if it is meant for, for first aid. So when you think about first aid, you're thinking of... If an emergency happens in public, what can I do for myself or for my family before an ambulance gets there? Like that's yeah. the role of first aid. That's what we all think of is it's not the stuff necessarily that you like. It's not tummy troubles necessarily. It's not I feel uncomfortable. Like when we think of first aid, we think of an emergency. Yeah, action needs to happen. So she's framing this as this is what you should do in an emergency. And then she d gives the disclaimer of, well, no, but I don't actually mean those emergencies. I actually mean when something is uncomfortable. Okay. <laughs> so that's kind of another disclaimer. 
yeah, and it's yeah, and it it's what's the problem with the whole thing is like you said, she go down into her comments and she's clearly giving medical advice. And I'm not trying to be mean, but the majority of the general populace, they have no idea anything about medicine, just like what they've been taught by their families, old wives, tales, whatever. So they're going to think she actually knows exactly what she's talking about. And they're going to take her word as, you know, as the, as the rule, and it's going to lead to some very bad situations. Right. And I, I'm going to ask you this question because I'm not a parent. I have never been a parent. Um, and I think there's this misconception and overconfidence that many parents have, especially uh, usually mothers will have that they have a child, therefore they automatically know what's best for their kid. What do you think it, about that? It happens all the time. And the thing is, like when we're talking about an emergency medical situation, um, moms tend to, and I'm especially moms who are high strung like I am, um, they tend to get on the way a little bit because they're like, well, I did this, this, and this, and this is what they did. This is how they responded, you know? And I'm like, okay, that's great, but I need to get in here and I need to like, assess your child and they really don't want to give up the control. And it's very mm -hmm. hard for new, especially new parents to give up the control for, uh, of their child because it's, it's their, it's their baby. And I, and I can understand that as a parent, but I also can understand from the paramedic view. It's like, you know, the 10 minutes I got to spend talking you down is 10 minutes. I could have been uh, working on your child and delivering the emergency care that I need to deliver. So my advice has always been, you know, just take a deep breath, step back and let the paramedics do their work. It's not like we're not going to talk to you and tell you what's going on all the way through, but you know, you have to, you have to trust in, in the, in mm. the paramedics that are going to be called to your house. And there definitely is a place for uh, parental intuition. Intuition Absolutely. is valuable in a lot of circumstances, namely for, knowing when something just isn't right. And mm -hmm. there's a lot to be said about being a parent and knowing that, hey, my kid isn't the way that they usually are. Something is not usual about them. I should get them evaluated. That that instinct is important. Absolutely. And in incredibly, incredibly life-saving to be able to react to something that you know is not normal. That's important. But the the issue is you should take that and then don't go so far to say that you therefore know the medicine or the expertise that needs to happen for your kid. Mm -hmm. uh, you should take that as I need to seek out an expert and get their opinion on it. And that's that even goes for um, the, the reason why medical professionals don't treat their own family. Exactly. You should not be because your bias is in the way you're already going to assume things. So you should be hands off of cases with your family. And I've put up boundaries with my own family saying, hey, this is not an issue that I'm comfortable talking about because I'm biased on this issue. You need somebody who's a third party who, um, hopefully somebody who does know you, like your family doctor should know you, your, if you have a specialist, they should know you well enough to know your condition. Yeah. But it shouldn't, they shouldn't know you like your family. Uh, that's a violation of boundaries. It absolutely is. And it, it actually does, it, like you said, it clouds your judgment because when hard calls need to be made, you it's it's darn near impossible to make them from that family position. If you were just a paramedic or a doctor, it'd be uh, a little bit easier for you to make those hard calls. And, you know, it just, uh, it, it creates such a, almost like a hostile environment I found when you try to treat your own family members because you know them so well. You're like, I know them. I know them. I know them. I know what they want. I want. I know what they need, but you're not really able to see the picture clearly. So it is a very, uh, very much a crossing of the boundaries. So in this list, she has a list of medications and, and things, and we might not touch deeply on all of them because there's a lot. Uh, but she does say that uh, she's put uh, suggestions from a naturopathic doctor, which is not a doctor. And you'll see in the list mm -hmm. that a lot of these are homeopathic and don't work. So <laughs> let's start from the beginning. So she says 
before we start, keep in mind, I didn't build this list overnight. It took many years of research and trial and error to find the remedies I use and trust the most. It's, this is not research. She did not do her research. <laughs> no, she did not. <laughs> so let's start off uh, with a favorite first aid myth, which is activated charcoal. What are your thoughts on activated charcoal? Um, actually, I um, I have ex some experience with it because when I was a paramedic, we carried it on the trucks. But she says to give, it works on food poisoning. That is like the big red flag for me is that I was like, why? Why would you want to drink activated charcoal? It's disgusting. You're already mm -hmm. throwing up. So if you're already throwing up, your body's already getting rid of what it doesn't what it sees as a problem in your system. Why would you want to compound that with taking activated charcoal? Because there's no guarantee it's going to work. It works on certain poisons, a large majority of them, but there's no guarantee it's going to work on food poisoning. And in fact, the mechanism does not make sense because the, the whole point of activated charcoal is to bind substances while it's in your stomach so that uh, it doesn't you know, cause damage to the rest of your tissues. So, and, and there's minimal evidence that it even works at all. Um, mm -hmm. You can use it. Uh, I know, I know emergency physicians that still do use it. It's not completely off the table, but the evidence is limited for it to work at all for uh, toxicities of namely medications yeah. or certain cleaning supplies, things like that are what it's meant for it's not meant for food poisoning uh food poisoning is going to be related either to an infection or uh toxins produced by certain microorganisms and that's not going to be bound by activated charcoal and especially if you have food poisoning when you're getting it it's not really your stomach so much that's being like infected it's the intestinal mucosa that's really having an issue so you're not even going to get the benefits of this and activated charcoal only has a limited window of what somewhere between like two and four hours that it's even helpful uh so i mean it's it's not off the table but it's not worth keeping on hand it's really just worth going to the hospital straight away exactly um, so the next one, uh, Arnica. So she says that Arnica is a topical cream used for muscle pain or injury, bruises, or any type of trauma. We found that it oh is great, greatly reduced healing time or bruises and sore muscles when used topically right after injury, not for internal use or on open cuts. So let's talk about that phrase real quick. Any type of trauma. I didn't realize when I was reading this, I kind of glossed over that phrase, mm -hmm. but that's scary. <laughs> that, that is very scary because I think that the way that some people think is, you know, if it's good enough to put on your skin, it'd be really great if I just took it internally or something like that. I get more healing for this bad trauma. The problem with Arnica is that it grows wild. And the second problem is, is that when you do take it internally, it is a toxin. It is absolutely poisonous. And um, I just can't imagine falling down, hitting my head, you know, getting, getting hit in the stomach. Let me put some Arnica on that while it's already bruising. I'm like, I see a bruise. I'm like, oh, I think we better get to the hospital. It's pretty big. And, you know, might be some internal bleeding there. But I, that yeah. just, I just don't even. Just... Uncle Beck says head injury, Arnica. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, it just doesn't. Hi, purple. Uh, hey, purple. It, it to me that just doesn't make any sense because anytime there's a trauma that's any type of trauma she says that covers a lot i mean from a skin knee to a freaking motorcycle accident they mm. all by definition fall under trauma it's just degrees can you imagine uh ben somebody wrecking their motorcycle and like limping home because i know some people who've done that yeah uh and going get me the arnica i mean me arnica. Out loud. <laughs> <laughs> this is even funnier because I I clicked on the link. Each of these has a link to like where you can buy this stuff. And Arnica is homeopathic. It is a homeopathic remedy. So it's not you're not even getting an actual effective dose of Arnica. You're getting a diluted, extremely, extremely diluted concentration of Arnica. 
So you're yeah. not getting anything. You're how would this work on trauma? How <laughs> much less like how would an ointment work on trauma at all? I mean, yeah. like apart from possibly uh, pain relief. But Maybe. how would something that's not even it doesn't even have an active ingredient. So you're purely <laughs> relying on placebo effect here. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and I mean, I can see and and I understand it's supposed to be like some it's supposed to reduce healing time. Okay, but mm -hmm. that's well after the trauma has happened. Okay, we're talking well yeah. after maybe. Maybe it'll yeah. help with that. But any form of trauma makes me just absolutely scared of what people are going to do with this stuff. But any and any time that they say reduced healing time, people love to throw that around. But I would love yeah. to see data, a study that shows that there is actually a significant difference mm -hmm. in the healing time, which they don't have. She doesn't have any you sources listed, zero yeah. sources listed for any of these. So she can throw, yeah, it reduces healing time. But how did you demonstrate that? How did I, how do we know that it didn't just heal on its own like it was going to do anyway? Exactly. We don't know that. And that's probably what happened, especially since Arnica has no, no effective concentration in it. No, exactly. Exactly. Um, and also I looked up the mechanism of action for Arnica mm -hmm. and so when we look at any medication, when we see it from a pharmaceutical standpoint, if you look up me uh, mechanism of action, you'll get a mechanism. They will describe this is how it works. It acts on this receptor, and then it stimulates this production of this, whatever it is you're talking about. You look up things like this, and you get meaningless language Mm -hmm. Like it stimulates your body's natural healing process, facilitating blood flow. And it's like, okay, what is, how, what does this mean? You're, you're saying it stimulates the body's natural healing process, but by what mechanism? That's what I was yeah. trying, trying to know. And you're not going to tell me. Oh, no, there's no way they can tell you because there's just not been <laughs> enough. There isn't one. Data. There isn't any. So, you know, I'm like, okay. <laughs> um. Yeah, and that that's the other thing is that like when they put up these um <laughs> sorry, I just read the comments. The Chronicles of Arnica. Funny. Uh when they put these articles up, they use words and language that are just close enough to being medical that people believe it. They're like, oh, it must yep. happen because of the way they word things and the way that they and it's it's mm -hmm. it's all it's shameful because they're telling people, hey, you know, do this, but there's no proof, there's no um you know, like you said, there's, where's your data? I want to see the data and, and read about how this actually worked. Not just your word of you or some naturopathy. So the next one, uh, cayenne powder. Oh, Lord. This is a fun one to talk about. Though this is a good addition to many foods, it's <laughs> even better to have in a medicine cabinet. I keep a few cayenne capsules in my purse as well. Topically, cayenne powder helps stop bleeding rapidly. I've read it. I've read of it being taken internally during heart attacks to increase blood flow and help clear blockage. Though, thankfully, I've never had to test this one. It is also a useful remedy to take internally during illness as it is shown to increase blood flow and speed recovery, although I do not give it to children. So I, I need to point out the obvious here boy, that, oh that she, she contradicts herself in two sentences. So she says, topically... Uh, cayenne powder helps stop bleeding rapidly. So she's talking about it as as a bleeding control. Mm -hmm. And then she talks about it being able to increase blood flow and clear blockage. Mm -hmm. So those are contradictory mechanisms. Are you using it to clot? Do you want it to clot? Or do you want it to not clot? Yeah. Because yeah. heart attacks uh, involve a clot and you want to get rid of the clot. So which is it? Are you? you it cannot be, I mean, dosage might matter but the way that she's saying this like she's using it for two contradictory mechanisms absolutely when, when i read this the first thing that came to mind was oh ouch why would you put cayenne powder in a cut it already hurts enough right let's put a spice in it so it can burn and hurt and you know you're gonna oh i can't even you you're gonna end up having to want to wash that out of there and any coagulating that it's done you're going to wash it away with the water just go with gauze y'all gauze and direct pressure are the best way to go for controlling bleeding 
Um, and you know, the more I, I read this, when I read the internal bleeding thing, all I could think of was just like, wow. Um, so if you take cayenne pepper and you take it to, you know, increase blood flow, the problem is, is she's saying she's, there's no dose, there's no time frame, no, mm -hmm. no anything. And, you know, I can see cayenne pepper causing a freaking bleeding ulcer. So it's going to be, mm. you, you know, you're going to end up doing the exact opposite of what this says it would do. Purple's got a really good point that any pretty much any powder on an open cut will probably cause it to clot. You're adding a, a foreign body in there. And Absolutely. yeah, and, and really, like, what is so bad about using pressure? Like, the best thing we know best thing. For, for bleeding is to put pressure on it. Mm -hmm. And especially if we're talking in a minor sense, like she's talking about, if you're like, if you have a cut on your finger and you apply pressure and it doesn't stop bleeding, you have a bigger problem because. Yeah. It's you should not be bleeding that much from something so small. So, like it, it's funny because because pressure is natural. It is as natural as you can get. You're just I'm holding my thumb over this and it's mm -hmm. gonna stop bleeding. Like why do you have to add this powder to it? And on top of that, I did look into this, um, and I'm I'm gonna stop sharing this screen momentarily because I want to share uh, some data that I found. about the antithrombotic property of cayenne pepper uh, extract in type O positive human blood coagulation. So from this paper, uh, this was in 2019, and they did find that uh, it in increased antithrombotic properties, as said. Uh, so you can use cayenne pepper for anticoagulation. So that being said, uh, and I'm not saying that we're necessarily going to shift to using this in, in a medical setting, but we do see some antithrombotic properties from uh, cayenne pepper. So that's legitimate. That is a legitimate thing that can be done, but also uh, that contradicts kind of the point that you should be using it for bleeds. Because uh, if, if you're giving this to somebody as a, an antithrombotic, you don't want to give it to somebody who already has a bleeding disorder. That's not going to be a good idea. Uh, yeah, exactly. And, you know, I was just looking at um, Purple had a comment. Well, what about uh, if you're taking Warfare? I'm sorry, not uh, Purple Cupcake did. And that's the concern I have there is that if somebody's yeah. already on something for that and then they take the, um, the Cayenne as well, <laughs> there is such a thing as thinning too much. And, uh, you know, hmm. that's not something that you should ever be trying to mess with because it is, I have actually never heard of somebody coming back from DIC, but that's because I see it mostly in trauma patients. I haven't ever seen it in anything that wasn't trauma. So yeah, DIC can also be caused, uh, in pregnancy, uh, a lot of, uh, autoimmune conditions can lead to DIC it's, it's pretty common. Uh, certain infections can lead to DIC. Uh, so yeah. as long as you revert whatever is causing the DIC, mm -hmm. you can get out of it. Um, right on. But yeah, this is not a good idea to give to somebody who's already on warfarin or an anticoagulating agent. Yeah. yeah. I would think of it uh, also, I mean, even something as simple as what they give you uh, when your cholesterol gets up like aspirin. I would think this would be uh, something you probably shouldn't take with aspirin as well. I'd probably avoid it. Like, yeah. talk to your doctor if you really, really wanted to take some cayenne powder. Um, no desire. And it would depend on the dose too, because like, yeah. if you use cayenne, like if you use cayenne pepper on your food and you're taking medications, that's probably not a problem in such a small dose. But uh, talk to your doctor if you have concerns about it, because they'll know what's best for you and, and what dosage your medications are. Exactly. Uh, so the next one, actually, I'm not mad about this next one. Uh, chamomile. I like this one. I agree with you. And it's not in emergencies, like not something that you should be using in an emergency, but they're saying that they use it to make a tea to help kids relax. Mm -hmm. um, you can. I don't know about putting it on your eye for pink eye. It might have some soothing properties i don't know like maybe don't put it like don't in squirt it directly into your eye oh god no but like i don't know if you wanted to put some tea on on like a compress or something i don't think that's a problem 
I think the way that they are meaning this is only because I learned this from my grandmother, that anytime Hmm. you have like a pink eye or like a sty, if you put a tea bag on your eye, it's wet, it's, you know, moist, you put it on your eye and leave it there, it will draw some of the toxins out and it'll make it feel better. But other than that, it doesn't really take care of the reason you have all that stuff. So yeah, it's a soothing thing. It's essentially putting a compress on it and being symptomatically relieved for a little bit. So I don't have a problem with that. Like, I don't have a problem with certain herbs that can be used for anxiety. Like, uh, and I know, Deb, you talk a lot about mental health, but certain, like, I'm not 100% anti-essential oil. I'm not anti, like, tea. I'm not anti any of this. It's just the reasons why you do it and making sure that you're doing it safely. Like, if you have a child that's having trouble falling asleep and, you know, a chamomile tea relaxes them... Mm-hmm. I'm not going to tell someone to stop doing that. Like okay. if you want to to use some lavender essential oil and you use it safely and it helps you through aromatherapy and helps you relieve your anxiety, I'm not going to be mad at you for that. That's mm-hmm. fine. Mm-hmm. And that's it, it. And like you said, when I talk about anxiety and I have uh, uh, anxiety disorder as well. So I use those things. I do use the chamomile teas. Um, because it does help me. Like when I'm particularly anxious, I'll drink one at night. It does help me actually go to sleep along with all the other medications I'm taking. So it's not like it's a, um, that's what I count on solely. But I do find that the lavender essential oil, I don't know what it is about it, but it puts me in a a, a different headspace and really does relax me. Whether it's a placebo effect or not, I don't care (laughs) because it, Mm -hmm. it does work. And I just literally put a little bit underneath my right under my nose, just a little bit. And, uh, it, it just, you know, takes you to, uh, takes your mind off of whatever else is going on that's keeping you from sleeping or relaxing. So, um, it, like, like you said, it, there's no reason to be mad at it. It's just, you have to use it appropriately and you can't use mm-hmm. it to, you know, um, solely take away your anxiety. Cause that's not going to happen. You really need to have a good therapist and a good relationship with a the therapist to help you with that kind of stuff. Yeah, so we're not going to be crapping on everything that people say. There, See, this is an example, and there are a couple others of things that she has that I'm really not upset with and would be fine if someone used. Yeah. The next one, however, is not one of those. <laughs> Comfrey is an external herb that promotes healing from injuries and broken bones. A poultice made with plantain and comfrey that is placed on a wound can greatly reduce the healing time. There we go again. I need data. And help prevent and reverse infection. I make a homemade neosporin with this and other herbs and use it on bug bites, cuts, bruises, and poison ivy. It is best to keep the dried herb on hand for poultices and homemade salves. And I looked a lot into comfrey. I don't know if you spent a lot of time looking into what this is. Um, This particular one, no, I did not. Okay, I will yeah. I will take over from here then because yeah. I had some fun. Yeah. Uh, so comfrey is a plant. Um, it's got roots and leaves that can both be used for uh, these salves. And it's got allantoin, which is a substance in skin. Um, and this has been used for a long time. But despite the fact that it's been used for a long time does not mean that it's safe or a good idea um so comfrey has been taken off of the market in a lot of countries and even it's been taken off the market in the united states in its uh ingestible form it you can still buy it as a salve or an ointment um but it's not it's not very safe because it has certain alkaloids uh that are hepatotoxic So it can cause liver disease, and it also is shown to have some carcinogenic properties. Um, So if you're at risk for liver cancer especially, I would stay away from this. Uh, And there are even some warnings that that I found um, that you should not even be using it as a cream or an ointment, uh, because even though if you put it on your skin— it will bypass the liver initially. At some point, it's still going to end up in the liver and you're still going to have issues with hepatotoxicity. Uh, So be very, very, very careful with that. Just because you're not 
eating it does not mean it's not going to go through your liver. So just be wary of this. Um, don't use comfrey with anything that also uh, is metabolized in the liver. Uh, so things like Tylenol is probably not a good idea yeah. uh, for this. Yeah. Um, things like alcohol, not a good idea. Um, certain uh, anticoagulants, not a good idea to be taking with this. So, I mean, I just would recommend you not do it. Uh, you can use, I don't see the problem with using a store-bought Neosporin. If you're looking for an antibacterial, yeah. why would you resort to something that is natural, but also known to be hepatotoxic when you can just get the, the Neosporin from the store? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, the big problem I have with this particular uh, one, I started laughing because I couldn't get past the fact that it helps fix fractures and yeah. uh, that I'm like, hmm, interesting. I couldn't get past it. I just started laughing. I'm like, I, oh my Lord, I, I just can't <laughs> see. I still can't. I just start laughing about the whole thing because it is so absolutely absurd um, to think that uh, that would help fix a broken bone. Well, and a lot of these two are being marketed for like, this is wellness mama. It's implied that she is using a lot of these things for her children. Mm -hmm. And the, the information that I've been reading is saying that you should not ever put this on the skin of a child. Do not ever not use ever. this with children. So don't take this advice and and people are gonna even though she did not explicitly say to use it on children it is implied by her article that you are using this for your family and using this on oh, your children absolutely just simply by her name that's what it implies is that it's a family thing yeah so do and not use this on your children be very careful just don't use it at all don't use it at all um, yeah. don't don't use it longer than 10 days at a time do not use it uh, for more than four to six weeks in one year. Be very, very, if you are going to use it, like I'm not saying do not use it, but if you are going to use it anyway, be very, very careful with it, please. Agreed. Be very careful. So the next one is eucalyptus herb and essential oils. And I don't have a whole lot of problems with this one for the reasons that she is using it um yeah. i know that eucalyptus is used often in certain lozenges uh it's used in in certain vapor rubs mm -hmm. so you can use this for like it's symptomatic relief it's not going to cure your pneumonia it's not going to cure exactly. your infection but if you're at home with a respiratory infection and you're really just struggling and not having a good time it's not going to be harmful to use it safely to put some of this on your chest or, or to use it in a way that is, is indicated for, um, not a problem. I don't see a problem with this one. How about you? Oh, no, none at all. In fact, I think that it, um, allows for people to get enough comfort that they are less anxious about being at home and letting the antibiotics do their work. Um, because if you can just take that tad bit of struggle out of your breathing, it makes you feel like, okay, I can make it through this. So I have a, no problem with it at all. And I have actually used products that have eucalyptus in it on my children and on myself, but it's usually been in a rub or in, um, uh, what are the, a humidifier. Those are the only times that mm -hmm. I've ever used it, but it does. It takes that, just takes that look, that edge off. And it really does allow you to give your body the time that it needs without the anxiety of uh, the, I feel difficult. It feels difficult to breathe. And we'll get into this in the, when we get to the peppermint. Um, but Sadie brings up an awesome point that be careful. If you are going to diffuse essential oils, um, mm -hmm. do not diffuse them. If you have pets in the home, uh, they can be toxic to your pets and can be harmful for your children. So just if you're going to infuse essential oils that you be safe about it and make sure that you don't have anybody vulnerable in the home that could be affected by it. Absolutely. So and next one, uh, again, I don't have a whole lot of problems with ginger. Ginger is, again, a symptomatic relief, not for emergencies. But yeah, if you have 
you know, some nausea, some mm-hmm. some morning sickness, some uh, just, you're not feeling all that great, but you're not sick enough to where like you I, you need to go to the doctor or the hospital. Mm-hmm. Like ginger's okay. Like I'm not yeah. mad at somebody who needs some ginger, or even if if you already saw your doctor for um, something related to your GI system. Okay. I'm not mad at you for, for using some ginger. No, I think that it falls in the same category as eucalyptus does because it takes that edge off and um, it makes you feel like you're doing something just a little bit more to make yourself more comfortable and given the time to give your body the time to deal with what's going on in any medications that your doctor might have uh, prescribed for you. So I, again, I, I don't have anything, I don't find anything wrong with it. I would, I would use it. Um, Titan Uranus. I will. He loves when I say his name. Uh, um, uh, we uh. can talk about that in a separate video because that might be a more in-depth discussion. But I appreciate the question. That's a good one. Um, the next one is a big, a big one. Uh, because I I see this one a lot, especially the naturopaths will peddle this one. My own family uh really likes the naturopathy stuff and we had this in in my home growing up a lot uh echinacea it's yeah. not a miracle cure it really there's really no evidence that echinacea works for anything like at all mm-hmm. um so it's a placebo effect absolutely but this person is saying that that she keeps homemade echinacea tincture on hand for severe illnesses I don't use it as a first resort, but it is helpful in prolonged illnesses. So do not use this for severe. So I think our definition of severe illness is very different because I think when she says severe illness, she means like, oh, my kid's been in bed for a week Mm -hmm. uh, and isn't going to school. Whereas my my definition of severe illness is you are in the ICU and are not able to leave or even if you're on the floors, the regular floor, but you're having complications uh that's severe illness that's severe. like anything yeah. you need to be hospitalized for is severe illness that's my definition and agree i agree with you i think that she's definitely talking about a different degree of illness than what you and i are thinking because i'm sitting here going why would you wait till it's severe if you're going to try the second asia why would you wait till it's severe you know they could be that's life threatening to me so right yeah you should just you know when in doubt Call your doctor, go see, please. go see your doctor, call your doctor, go to the hospital, whatever you got to do. Uh, echinacea, echinacea is not first line for anything. It does not work at all. There's minimal evidence that it's helpful uh, beyond a placebo effect. So, but I, I'm worried that somebody in the comments like would read this and say, oh, it's for severe illnesses. And even though her definition might mean something different than mine, somebody reading this might have the same definition that Deborah and I are using. So that's the problem. It's it's very ambiguous. And a lot of what she says is ambiguous to where people are going to get hurt by this advice. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, like when I was first diagnosed with um, my autoimmune um, disorder, people told me, oh, tr- get on echinacea right away. Make sure it's every day. You'll do your echinacea. Well, you know, um, it'll help your medicines and your body fight what's going on. And so I did it. And then I went to my doctor. He goes, you need to stop taking that right now because it's going to mess with your blood pressure and it's going to mess with your heart rate. It's going to actually make you feel worse because it's going to start interacting with your medication. So I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to stop. So yeah, if you are taking any medications at all, you should be talking with your doctor about um, if if you want to start one of these more natural remedies, disclose everything with your provider because it might be the case where they say it's okay for you to to do whatever natural thing you want to do as long yeah. as they're monitoring it but somebody should be monitoring it exactly and that's you know i agree with you. you have to be open and honest with your doctor and in the time we live in right now it's still especially important even with like marijuana it's important that you disclose to your doctor that you're using it so that they can take that into account because it does make a difference uh in the way that you know, your body handles things. So it's, uh, it's important that you be totally honest. Yep. Um, and I've, I'm seeing there's a lot of questions in the chat and I'm marking them for later and I will, we'll 
answer the questions at the end. I think that'll be the easiest way to uh, go through those. Uh, the next one, Peppermint. Again, I don't have a lot of problems with this one. Um, don't use it in emergencies. Don't use it around your pets. Don't don't use it around very young children. Exactly. But it tastes. It smells good. If you put it in a candy cane, it's really tastes good. But other than that, you know, I have never used it. So. All right, plantain. This one. <laughs> did you did you look up this one at all? I did, but probably not as thoroughly as you did. I was pretty like just go for it. Lord. Go for no, it. What did you find I, out? I can't read it, so um, you go ahead and start, because I'm sitting here looking okay, at it. Okay, I'll, I'll read it, and then I'll let you address it. Okay. You've probably pulled this as a weed without knowing it. I keep the dried herb on hand at all times to make a poultice for poison, poison ivy, bites, stings, cuts, and infection. In a pinch, I've picked some from the ground, chewed it, and put it on a bee sting for immediate pain relief. What are your thoughts? Um... Wow. Okay. So the first thing I want to do for the, the, we'll address the, the bee sting. You shouldn't be putting anything on it until you remove the stinger. That's the most important thing. Okay. Um, and I don't know why you would chew up a leaf and put it on there, leave a uh, weed when you could do, um, just simple ice. And, um, my concern is that you are going to be getting, um, toxins as well with the weed. And the, uh, with the poison ivy and stuff like that, with poison ivy and poison oak, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't it the oil that they excrete that causes the problem? So if you're, I know they're trying to dry it up, but if you dry it up and then wipe it off with something, isn't the oil just on that thing and you have to like either wash it or burn it? I can't remember what the uh, exact one was with that, but. My thoughts were this, just this, I mean, there's got to mm. be, there's better ways to deal with it than, than, than this plantain. I mean, yeah. they make, um, oh gosh, Ben, the pink stuff that you can get, uh, for itching at the store. I can't remember what it's called. Somebody help me. Um, I don't remember either. I know what you're talking about though. Yeah. 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 But I just, again, I just don't, I'm not comfortable with the fact that you're getting a basic weed and. A, that you're chewing it up to make something uh, to put on a bee sting or that you're putting it on on the body in itself. I just, I'm not comfortable with it. Calamine, that's exactly what it's called. <laughs> uh, let me share another window. So here's what I was looking into. Because, um, of course, with a lot of these, I was looking up the uh, legitimacy and efficacy of, of any of these plants. So plantain or uh, plantago... Species as modulators of prostaglandin E2 and thromboxane A2 production in inflammation. So this is a very similar mechanism uh, as a COX-1, COX-2 inhibitor and thromboxane A2 inhibitor that we see with aspirin. Uh, so we get essentially the same mechanism as aspirin with this plant. So two things with that. Number one, that means, okay, there's some legitimacy to the fact that it functions as an anti-inflammatory. Cool. We got that. Mm -hmm. The problem is that it functions like aspirin. So that means you have to take the same precautions that you would with aspirin. Uh, so if you have somebody with platelet issues, probably not a good idea since the inhibition of thromboxane A2 is going to inhibit platelet aggregation. So not the best for you if you have platelet issues. Uh, also, do not give this to children uh, because yeah. we know that aspirin causes Rye syndrome and it is very problematic, except for we know there are a couple conditions where you can give aspirin to children. Uh, Kawasaki disease is namely the most important one. Um, but otherwise, you should not be giving this to children. And with that, having the same mechanism as aspirin You'd be much safer just taking aspirin. Yeah. And note that when we say you're taking aspirin, take it in the um, anti-inflammatory dosage, which is different than the uh, anti-platelet dosage. Mm -hmm. So the, the 81 milligram or the baby aspirin, which is not meant to be given to babies, but it's the small aspirin, that is the uh, anti-platelet dosage. But then when you buy aspirin... Um, like in the bigger tablets, that's the anti-inflammatory dosage. So that's what you're looking for here. Uh, so it's going to be much safer to get 
a studied and approved and regulated container of aspirin from the pharmacy than it is to risk it and use a plant that you found in your backyard that you cannot regulate the concentration of aspirin in it. You can't, and I say aspirin loosely because it's not the same compound, but same mechanism. So like if you had the active ingredients in the plant, you don't know how much is in there. You're not getting a set dosage. You're also getting potentially other compounds in the plant that you're having to deal with as well, which could cause uh, interactions with your other medications. So it's just, it's really just smarter to use aspirin. You don't need to be natural about it. Just use the aspirin. So I know, Ben, that there's new research out there because I was just reading, Mm. uh, began to read an article, but shouldn't, when I was learning all my stuff, I would have cautioned pregnant women from using this as well because of Rye syndrome. Um, But now they're suggesting that it's not as uh, common occurrence as it was when I was uh, pregnant. I'd have to look into that. I don't have an answer right off the top of my head. And I want to give you correct information. I appreciate that about you. Um, But yeah, so I think uh, Slippery Elm is one that I looked into a little bit. Yeah, I don't Um, know anything about that one. Sorry. They're suggesting to make it as a lozenge, which it doesn't seem to be too problematic. Um, It's probably okay for the most part, but it's recommended to take precautions with children uh, make sure that if you are going to use this, that you consult uh, your doctor before you do. Yeah, so that's the same thing with, with what it. you just said is like, you know, you just don't know how much you're getting. That's the thing that that worries me about ingesting any of these is like, I just don't know how much I'm getting. Yeah, the next one, let's the next few are are more fun to talk about. And we might skip over like, well, we'll go pretty quickly through some of these because I know there's a point later on that. uh we really, really, really want to talk about mm-hmm. apple cider vinegar. Uh, they say here that I keep a bottle of organic apple cider vinegar with the mother. So like the how they produce the apple cider vinegar mm-hmm. uh, on hand for digestive troubles, in, indigestion, food poisoning, and more. Taking a dose of one teaspoon per eight ounces of water every hour. It helps shorten the duration of any type of illness. Though it is tough to get kids to take it willingly. It's tough Any to get type me of to illness. Take it. Any type of illness, she says. Uh, well, shoot, we should have sent this to the government. Maybe we could have uh, stopped COVID a long time ago. Stop COVID, stop cancer. <laughs> right? uh, stop. Yeah. Like, I'll, I'll take it for my DIC, you know, <laughs> I, all okay. of my illness, my diabetes. You know, it, it cures everything. It's going to shorten every type of illness. Oh, Lord. Oh, all this time. We didn't know. We've been doing all this medical research and we could have just found it right here. Yeah. Yeah. That is the most absurd thing I've read today. Any type of illness, huh? Wow. Mm-hmm. And the fact that it's funny how they, they have an acid here. And sure, okay, it might help with some indigestion. But like if you're having acid reflux do you want to give somebody more acid Acid? is that smart (laughs) no i I agree with you 100 percent on that because that stuff actually gives me indigestion i swear every time i take it and i've been told to take it to um the reason i was trying it was um it was supposed to be part of a cleanse to lose weight so i thought i'd try it and oh never again never again Mm -mm. nope it didn't make sense. I was like, all right, I'll give it a shot. I took one drink of it and I was like, oh no, oh no, 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 no. I won't be able to move or breathe for a while because it's it's awful. And I know somebody who puts it on every single thing that they eat uh, because he had a history of pancreatitis and he swears that this keeps him from having to deal with pancreatitis again. So I'm oh, like, no. oh boy, okay. <laughs> Yeah, so not a panacea. Don't don't use this for everything. I mean, if you really want to drink it because it tastes good, which it doesn't, but if you think it tastes good, fine. You can cook yeah. with it. It probably it's probably great to cook with, but just not to take as a medicine. Yeah, vitamin C. I mean, I'll keep this one short because I'll probably do a whole episode on vitamin C. But no, just no. <laughs> 
that's kind of like you know you get the cold you get a cold and everybody's like drink orange juice you need your vitamin no. c no, no. Or put if you're not deficient on. if you're not deficient you don't need more vitamin c if you are deficient then you need some vitamin c done mm -hmm. uh aloe vera that one's fine they can have that yeah i love that i actually love aloe vera <laughs> it, it's got a cooling property and i like that but yeah, uh, and again, for symptomatic relief, mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with that at all. Go for it. Um, Epsom salt. Again, I'm not mad at that. It's great for symptomatic relief. Yes. Um, if if you have sore muscles, I agree. It can be used for that. Um, if you have issues with your fluid balance, uh, okay. maybe be careful. Yeah. <laughs> be very careful. Uh, like if you have kidney disease or if you have uh, congestive heart failure, make sure that you are talking with your doctor before you attend something like this. Uh, they, you know, might recommend something like it. If you are volume overloaded, it might be helpful. But make sure that you're talking with your healthcare professional before you do that. Uh, and if you have any medical history, but otherwise go for it. Yeah, agreed. Um, I don't even know if we, I really want to get into the hydrogen peroxide and the neosporin because I really don't care. We kind of talked about, mm -hmm. I mean, like they're, it's fine. Um, talk to your doctor. Witch hazel is a good one. And I did want to talk about that because um, it is used. This one is absolutely used in hospital settings for uh, postpartum trauma. Yes. Because uh, it is a vasoconstrictor. So if you're having excessive bleeding after having a baby, it can be beneficial. We do see this on little, they give you a little pad at the hospital with mm -hmm. witch hazel in it oftentimes. So this is evidence-based. Absolutely. And it's actually been used for quite a long time because I used, uh, I had to use witch hazel with one of my deliveries and my youngest is, 24 this month so it's it's been out there for quite a long time and it honest i i felt the difference like within probably about 45 minutes to an hour i was like okay i can feel i feel a little better so whether it was placebo that fast or not it was just uh it did it did its job mm -hmm. gelatin so I'm very confused about how they think gelatin is besides being soothing mm -hmm. because like, I mean, it's, it's great to eat things with gelatin. Like it tastes good for the most part. Um, but for first aid, I don't understand why this would be a first aid anything. I have absolutely no idea. I know that it's one of the things that we recommend uh, when people are vomiting and we tell them, you know, mm -hmm. wait an hour when you've stopped vomiting, you can, you can try things that you can see through and gelatin falls under that. And if you can't keep it down, then you have to go the whole hour again. But I remember when I was younger, they said, if you want strong, healthy nails, you have to do this gelatin to get strong, healthy nails. But I see absolutely no reason to have it in a first aid kit. I mean, um, I know I can't, mm -mm. I was trying to think of something that might be a little bit, um, Maybe they're sticking cuts together with it or something. I have absolutely no idea. Wow. So uh, they're claiming that it's great for anti-inflammatory effects. They're also claiming that it can... I, I knew they are going to make this claim about uh, aging. They think it can slow aging. And it probably is decent for skin and hair. I don't know. Maybe. But... That's, yeah. That's what I was always initially told. You know, you get the mm -hmm. long, beautiful hair and the nails and all that. But there's, I, I guess you can slow the aging process, but you certainly can't stop it. You know, and eating right and walking and doing your, and drinking enough water will do that as well. So it'll slow it down. I mean, it'll, uh, yeah. This is, yeah, this is funny. Um, and you can use collagen for a protein source. However, if you are going to, and this is a nutritional thing, um, it's not a complete protein, so it does not have all the essential amino acids. So you cannot use it as your sole protein source. You need to add something else. Um, but I mean, it's just, I mean, it's a food. Uh, yeah. I'd have to look into this more, I think, but I don't see a reason why this needs to be in your first aid kit. 
it doesn't make any sense at all to me. Uh, the next one, we're going to talk a good bit about baking soda. <laughs> oh, Lord. We're going to talk about <laughs> baking soda. So she says, also a good remedy to keep on hand for severe heartburn or UTIs. One fourth table, uh, teaspoon can be taken internally to help alleviate quickly. It can also be made into a poultice and used on spider bites. All right, let's get into the baking soda. And I know you had a lot to say on this, so I'm going to let you start. It, it This one just baffles me, baffles me, because I've seen this time and time again with um, the heartburn. You know, hmm. it doesn't say how often you know, how long you should continue with it. And I've seen in certain cultures, baking soda is used for just about everything. And many a times I have seen men who are treating their heartburn and they've been treating it this way for like, you know, two weeks with baking soda. Oh, it makes me feel better initially. So, you know, when it comes back, I just take it again. The problem is, is they're taking it in so much so often that they're throwing off their body pH and they can't understand, you know, why they're feeling crappy. And then they keep doing it until they eventually collapse because the body cannot maintain uh, homeostasis when it's, uh, when you're doing that kind of stuff to the body pH, it just can't. And I am absolutely floored with why they wouldn't just go to the store and buy a little antacid pe uh, pill or get some Rolaids or mm. something like that. It's much, it's easy, it's convenient, and you don't have to drink baking soda, which to my, I would think that'd be pretty disgusting. But it is definitely an old school remedy that, you know, uh, I've seen, everybody I've seen do this has been a little bit older than I am, and I'm in my 50s, but it just, it is so dangerous. People think it's so benign. Oh, it's baking, uh, baking powder. No big deal. We use it all the time. It is so dangerous when you start messing with the amount of mm -hmm. taking it every day for prolonged periods. It's just, it's too, da oh, it's too dangerous for even words. Yeah. Uh, you're causing a metabolic alkalosis and that's the problem. Like dosage is incredibly important. And there is some legitimacy to symptomatic relief of UTIs from baking soda in water, but it's not meant to be consumed. Um, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to mix a little bit of baking soda in your bath water and then sit in it. And then uh, the water, you know, helps kill some of the bacteria if you have any and helps uh, neutralize some acid in the urethra. So it can be soothing to do that. But that's very different than drinking it. You should not be drinking your baking soda. Uh, and especially like Deborah was saying, if you already have heartburn or some acidity issue, you don't want to be messing with that more without a uh, doctor's advice. So just you can take some regulated antacids. Um, and if it's bad enough, you might want to look at being on a proton pump inhibitor or an H2 blocker. That might be a better way to go. And also considering the fact that if you have history of GERD, um, you will probably need to look into uh, if you have H. pylori. Uh, that needs to be something that's ruled out. So I would not recommend if you're getting heartburn so frequently and, and very severely that you you shouldn't handle it yourself. You should be evaluated and, and make sure you don't have something like H. pylori. Um, mm -hmm. But I did I did find something, and I want to share this one as well. Um, looking at this myth of baking soda <laughs> yeah. or UTIs. And I found this paper in the Journal of Clinical Pharmacy and Therapeutics from 2013. And... It's titled Baking Soda Misuse as a Home Remedy Case Experience of the California Poison Control System. So this study, uh, it looked back at all of the poison control calls in California during 2013. And the data ended up saying that 4 to 7% of these calls were from people using uh, baking soda to treat UTIs at home. So this myth isn't just something silly that people have been saying. People are doing this I mean and yeah. they are calling poison control for it. Um, 
the other six, 60, 64%, like 60 to 64% of these uh, were for antacid use. Um, 11 to 5, uh, plus or minus 5% are for beating a urine drug test. Oh, wow. And so out of all of these people that had called, so they, they evaluated 192 cases, and then 12 of these required hospital admission and developed either electrolyte imbalances, metabolic alkalosis, or respiratory depression. Wow. So this is very dangerous. It is. So it's, don't um, don't do this, please. Yeah, and and I'm sitting here thinking about what you're saying about trying to treat it uh, a UTI with it. I'm like, I even get an inkling of a UTI. I'm in the doctor's office because that hurts to to have to urinate. Is you have a total conversation with yourself. How bad do I really have to go to the bathroom because it hurts mm -hmm. so bad? So that's not something you even want to be messing with because I can you imagine if they did that and then they end up getting a kidney infection which yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, that usually requires hospitalization. Um, mm -hmm. yep. And I just, I can't imagine putting yourself through that. Mm -mm. No, thank you. Yeah. Uh, the next one is probiotics, uh, which it's okay to have these around. Um, like if you've been on antibiotics, it's good to be on a probiotic. Uh, so she's recommending them to people with, Skin conditions, uh, not really. Because um, when you're taking a probiotic, it's going through your intestinal tract. So the main thing is to restore gut bacteria. Uh, it's not going to be useful really elsewhere. Um, so if you have a kid who gets constant ear infections and needs to be on antibiotics frequently, that's a time when probiotics might be useful. Uh, but again, it's not a cure all. It's not going to improve your skin. It's not going to just make you a healthier person in general. It's just, you know, I think it just like you said, it alleviates a problem that could happen if you're on antibiotics. Yeah. You know, and I would recommend this. Um, again, I'm not a doctor, but I do this anytime I have a UTI. I immediately start eating probiotics because um, I don't want to have any secondary problems. And that's yeah. Exactly and there you go. Um, so coconut oil, uh, and her, her reason for coconut oil is actually okay. Cause she's saying like, okay, well not as an antifungal treatment. That's one I'm like, eh, probably not. Um, but for, you know, dry skin, chapped lips. Okay. For like a diaper cream. Okay, fine. You can use it for that. Um, it's feels nice on your skin. Um, but don't use it as an antifungal. No, it doesn't. There's no research backing that up. That's I can't personally use it at all because I am deathly allergic to coconuts. So that is not something that I can do ever. Uh, and then she has. So that was all stuff from the first aid kit. That's mm -hmm. not from the medicine cabinet. That's from the, the first aid kit. And now we have the medicine cabinet, which has all the bandages and stuff, which some of these are funny. Um, Bandages, okay, if you want to buy 100% organic bamboo bandages, like, go for it. Spend your money. Um, yeah. Yeah. Bandages, <laughs> gauze. I want to hear your thoughts on super glue for, not necessarily for uh, emergency department use, uh, but mm -hmm. for home use. How do you feel um, about people using super glue on their cuts at home? Okay. Um, I come from this one from personal experience because I have one of those husbands who is like, ah, eh, slap some dirt on it. You'll be all right. So he literally uh, started to suture his own leg and he got about halfway through it and said it was too painful. So he put super glue on it and then kind of just put the band-aids across the butterflies across it to bring it together. All I can say is infection galore. OK, because that's not something that was meant for medical treatment. It's I mean, mm -hmm. yes, there are super glue type stuff that we do live use in the emergency room and stuff like that. But it's not the stuff we have at home, you mm -hmm. know, and this 
you have to clean out a cut. You got to do all these things in order to close it. And none of that stuff got done. So it was infected something fierce. And I think for using it at home, it is a really bad idea because I think that people will use it on cuts that they have no business super gluing. Um, yep. I think that it will, they will be on deep ones and they're like, Oh, I can just super glue this together. And they're going to end up with all these scars and infections and more trouble than it was worth. It would probably be easier just to go to the emergency room and get it stitched up. Plus, it, yeah, correct so, me if I'm wrong on this one, but isn't it like mm -hmm. 12 hours, Ben? Um, if you wait longer than 12 hours, you can't even get it stitched up in the in the ER. So if you're putting, I don't know the on, protocol. Okay. Currently, uh, but like the fact that she says that she has used this instead of stitches, implying that oh. the that the injury she had required stitches like it was bad enough to need stitches and she's like nah i got nah. this i'm gonna super glue it <laughs> like no don't do this like if oh. you need stitches go get go stitches. to the doctor and get stitches and because and, again, and like yeah oh, i'm sorry I'm oh sorry, and if you ahead. and if she's saying that it works on the face and other places that scar easily so if that's the case, like if oh. if you're talking about cosmetics, you are not a good person to do that because you're not trained in how to stitch something in a way that it's not going to show. Like the person you need is a plastic surgeon. That Absolutely. is their job is to make sutures that are cosmetically appealing. So don't do this yourself. You are not a plastic surgeon. So no. just don't don't even bother. Mm -mm. It's going to be worse. Oh, such a big headache, you know? I mean, my God. Ugh. Um, and then, like, the rest of these, not really a, a problem. Like, yeah, I have bandages at home. But uh, the enema kit. Do you think people should have an enema kit at their house? Mm. Uh, okay, I'm going to be honest. I'm a little torn there. And the reason why I'm yeah. torn is because I've spent a lot of time working with the elderly. And mm -hmm. that is an absolute concern with that demographic of people because, oh definitely you know everything slows down um but do i think that it should be done at home um again my concern is that Beck. if one yeah if one doesn't work <laughs> i know Beck. i know <laughs> great thank you Beck. i appreciate that one then my concern <laughs> is that I can't <laughs> oh goodness sakes okay my concern is that most people tend to think um, if a little's good, then a lot is better. So my concern would be if they're giving one enema or and that doesn't work very well, they're going to give two or three more and that will create problems in itself. Plus with that group of people, you're going to have um, people who start to have memory problems and they're going to forget that they have these given these enemas. I don't think at any point you should ever give like a child an enema. I think that you need to do other things to get things rolling for them because you don't want to mess up the chemical, not the chemical. You don't want to mess up their digestive tract by help, by forcing it out with an enema. So I would say um, maybe in older people, I would be comfortable with it as long as it was monitored. But otherwise, I wouldn't exactly. think it's a great idea. I wouldn't. Yeah. And like, and yeah, if you have older people that you're taking care of and you talk to their doctor and say, Hey, I noticed that, you know, this is required quite frequently for my grandmother. Is it okay if we do this at home? Like, okay, cool. Yeah. Um, don't just do it for funsies. Like, <laughs> I mean, unless, I mean, if you're doing it for uh, certain reasons that uncle Beck had said, okay, that's a different story, but medically, like it's, <laughs> it's medically not the, the go-to First of all, for like constipation and things oh, like there, there are things you should do first. But like if if you're a young person and, and think you need an enema, you probably need a doctor first before you need that enema. So just. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, and it, it just like I don't know anybody who would go, hey, you know what? I think I need an enema. I think like people would tell you would go to like Dokalax or something like that first. And yeah. say, hey, let's see what we can do here. But yeah, no, all right. But all I right. do know, uh, <laughs> I know I'll back in it. the day when my grandparents, so long, long time ago, that was normal. You you did enemas. If you didn't go in two days, you got an enema. And that's something my grandmother told me. I was like, oh, no, thank you. No, thank you, grandma. Wow. Yep. 
All right, uh-huh. let's um, let's answer some questions. I think from the audience. Uh, so the first one, and I'm going to actually let uh, Deborah take this one because oh it's a great question for you. Uh, you should address the myth of holding someone's tongue or moving someone's tongue out of the way when they have a seizure. Um, it's actually absolutely unnecessary, and the reason being that the tongue is attached. Um, but the only thing that you should be doing in a seizure, um, type scenario is to clear the area and, um, allow the seizure to pass. And once the seizure passes, you can put them in a, what we consider a neutral position. So like if they're on the floor and laying on your side, either way, as long as they're not, their chin isn't slumped down, you can put it, their head in a neutral position. This will allow them to breathe. It is actually quite normal when you are having ha, coming out of a seizure to have very decreased respirations or even some snoring respirations. If it considers, if it continues past the 15 second mark, then you need to do some adjusting to the airway, but there's really nothing to do with the tongue by sticking your hand in there or a wallet in there. It's just the alignment of the head. That's going to keep the, the tongue from. Uh, yeah. Do not blocking the airway. So it's actually recommended yeah. that you do not put anything yep. in their mouth. And the, the simple reason for that is that they chomp down really hard. Mm. And if you're trying to force that, you're going to cause more trauma to their person or the unlucky individual who sticks their fingers in somebody's mouth. You're going to now have trauma because they have no control over what they're doing when they're having a seizure. Uh, and again, I have to stress anytime you have somebody who's having a seizure, uh, call 911. Uh, if you don't know them, call yep. 911, get the paramedics out there because we have equipment that can help uh, and drugs that can help. Yep. I hope that answered your question. Uh, the next one is from Scapegoat Iscariot. Um, I do not, I've not heard of Butcher's Broom and I would need to look into that for you. But let me, yeah. let me look into that because I don't want to give uh, faulty information. Um. Next one is from Mark. Uh, is there any merit to what we think of as old time cures? I mean, there must be something to them. Some of them, yeah. Some of them there is merit. And we've refined to be more regulated and safer now. Uh, so a lot of our medications that we that we use come from those old timey cures. And then the ones that aren't effective, we've gotten rid of. And we've kept the ones that do work. So I do want to uh, do a whole medical myths about old timey medicine. And we'll, we'll probably... Do an episode on that, but I hope that that answered it. Um, will consumption of probiotics replace bad biotics in your gut? Will it up the proportion of probiotics? So, so the probiotics are going to grow everything, uh, but the idea is that you want to have enough of your helpful bacteria to overcrowd the ones that are problematic, so that um, they cannot as easily penetrate the mucosal barriers. Um, so it's not, you're not going to have a probiotic that is, is like, um, you're not only going to favor environment for good bacteria, uh, but you can help out compete the ones that you don't want to have there. So it's just, it's playing with the, the food availability and resource availability for those bacteria and making sure that the ones that you don't want there, uh, are going to not have as many resources and they're going to die out. So that's that's the premise behind it. Um, and then is there enough good in kombucha to pay for it? It's an expensive drink. Um, if you need a probiotic, I'd recommend something like medically uh, like given to you by uh, recommended by your doctor because they're going to have um, the better ones to use. So, I mean, kombucha is not like in small amounts is not going to be a problem, but it's probably, you probably shouldn't medicate with kombucha. So hope that was helpful. Do we have any other questions in the chat? Uh, I'm whiskey enemas. I, oh, we'll do a whole episode about Ooh. enemas. The enema episode is coming. Um, but let's, uh, let's kind of wrap this up. So kind of let's debrief. How do we feel about this article that we read? Any takeaways from today's episode? Um, Yeah, my big takeaway is don't listen to this woman. She doesn't know what she's talking about. Um, And my other takeaway is just to tell people like 
simply, I mean, get, have a good relationship with your doctor so you can go and see them. And if you do try one of these home remedies, please, please be honest with about it with your doctor because you, it affects your body in so many ways. And doctors are trained to know that. So, oh my heavens, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just read that. I was like, what? Um, it affects your body in so many ways. So you can't take the word of somebody who is not a doctor, especially one that says I'm not a doctor, but gives out medical advice. So be leery because there are charlatans out there that will tell you anything, um, about how to cure yourself and a, they're either selling you something or B they're trying to get something out of you. So just be careful. Definitely always be skeptical. Make sure that you are looking into, uh, whatever's being told to you. And make sure, yeah, you talk to your doctor, talk to somebody who knows more than you about if you should do something, make sure that the person who's giving you advice knows your medical history and knows what you should be doing because some random person on the internet is not going to be able to work with you in the nuance of your specific case and your specific goals for your treatment. Um, oh, Titan Uranus, that would be a great topic for the uh, mm. enema the episode. Anima we talk about constipation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but oh, once okay. again, let's let uh, Deb, would you like to tell the audience once again where they can find you since some new people join us? Absolutely. Um, I stream every Monday night at uh, 7 p.m. Pacific time. My uh, channel is Let's Get Real About Mental Health. And it's a place where we come together to discuss different things that affect the mental health of, uh, of different people. Um, and it's a place where you can come with any questions or comments or anything you want me to talk about. We'll address it in there. And we're just open and honest. Uh, I'm open and honest absolutely about everything goes on in my life. So you don't feel alone. You know there's somebody else out there for you. So that's the whole purpose of the channel. Go watch Deb's channel. Go subscribe to Deb. There's a reason why I brought her on today. And I mean, part of it is because of her experience. Part of it is because I think she has amazing things to give to the community. And I want her name to, to be going out there. So everybody go watch her videos, go subscribe. She does a fantastic job. Uh, I will you, show a little bit of my stuff here before we wrap up. So um, obviously you are here for Medical Myths. We are going to continue keeping Medical Myths on Saturdays at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Um, I hope to continue to be consistent, although with my residency interviews, you might have a few weeks where I might not be here, but I will let you know when that happens. Uh, we have Trivia Night, which I am actually going to be moving Trivia Nights to uh, 9.30 Eastern Time instead of 9, because we have uh, a lot of people coming over from Truth Wanted on those Friday nights. Uh, so I'm going to just move Trivia Night a bit later so that people can... Uh, join when they're able to. Um, and then Sunday, so tomorrow, uh, I'm going to be on Talk Heathen. So stop in for that. And then the Sunday after that, I will be doing the Sunday show. So definitely stop by for those. And then after this, we have the uh, Patreon exclusive after show. If I can pull this up. Thank you to our patrons. We got some new patrons. Uh, Reggie, Yay. Kevin, Uncle Beck, Hannibal, Tons of Mice, Sadie, and Jody L. Thank you for uh, supporting the channel. Your support means a lot. And as a thank you to all of you, we do a Patreon exclusive after show. About 15 minutes after this show ends, we will be jumping over there. There's a link on the Patreon for those of you that have access to it. And um, anything else that you'd like to um, pass on? I just wanted to add one thing because I always forget about him. Um, yeah. But I want to give a shout out to my new producer, Beck. He absolutely is helping me get my show in order and making it possible so like I can start having guests on and uh, really helping support my channel to get to be a bigger channel. So thank you, Beck. I appreciate it. Yep. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And stay curious. We'll see you all next time. Bye, everyone.